Satori. In this frame of mind, he goes to the master, no longer proud and enthusiastic, but embarrassed and uncertain. He keeps silent, knowing he cannot say what is boundlessly clear to him. Or else he stammers out something incoherent, unwilling to offer it as a solution. The master looks through him at once. Possibly he knew, as soon as the pupil opened the door, that this was the real thing. Satori. Enlightenment. He calms and strengthens him. What has happened? The pupil has not found any new interpretation, any new thought. Rather, in a flash of enlightenment, he has come to the solution as if a new spiritual eye had been let onto his head. The things he sees are no different from him before. He just sees them differently. His vision, as well as perhaps he himself, has changed. Hence there is no direct way from the ordinary mode of seeing and apprehending to this new version conditioned by Satori. It is more like jumping into a new dimension. Accordingly, this new vision cannot be compared to anything else, and is, strictly speaking, indescribable. But is there no hope, even, of hinting at its characteristics? If not, there would be nothing but a vacuum, and everything that logically follows from this vision would be more incomprehensible than ever. For later and higher stages of Zen have their roots in this fundamental in intuition, in this realization at first glance. And so, for those who cannot go the way of Zen themselves, and know about it only from hearsay, an attempt must be made to describe the vision somehow, however inadequately. But the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon itself, as the Zen masters rightly observe. Suzuki is very much aware of the need to do this. He calls it an illuminating insight into the very nature of things. Satori is a sort of inner perception, not the perception, indeed, of a single individual object, but the perception of reality itself, so to speak. Perception of the highest order. If we want to get to the very truth of things, we must see them from the point of view where this world has not yet been created, where consciousness of this and that has not yet been awakened. These remarks are undoubtedly correct. They are as enigmatic as Satori itself. There is a danger in their activating the reader's fantasy and powers of reflection, so that he will form a mental picture which, no matter how it turns out, will always be misdrawn. I will therefore try a different approach, in the hope of conveying a few hints. The first characteristic, it seems to me, of the new way of seeing is that all things are of equal importance in its sight, the most trivial as well as the most significant by ordinary human standards. They all seem to have acquired an absolute value, as if they had become transparent, revealing a relationship which does not obtain in the ordinary field of vision. This relationship is not horizontal, linking one thing to another and so remaining within the world of objects, but vertical. It plumbs each single thing to its very depths, to the point of origination. Things are thus seen, and at the time understood, from the origin, out of the being which manifests itself in them. To that extent, they are all of equal rank, all possessing the illustrious patents of their origin. They are not themselves objects isolated. They point beyond themselves, to the common ground of their being. And yet this ground can be perceived only through them, through what exists, although it is the origin of all existence. Let us be quite clear about one thing. There is not the slightest trace of reflection in this way of seeing, nor does it come about with its secret collaboration. It is not that the vision is expected, wished for, assumed to exist, as a result of prolonged meditation on the cone, so that in the end you believe you see your own assumption. Rather, the vision comes upon you like a flash of lightning at a single stroke. It is so physically clear that it brings with it absolute certainty, 
so that you are instantly seeing and understanding that things are by virtue of what they are not, and that they owe their being to this not-being, which is their ground and origin. Perhaps an anecdote, often used as a cone, will explain what is meant. One day, as Hayakujo stepped out of the house with his master Basso, they saw a flight of wild geese. Beso asked, Where are they flying? They have already flown away, master. Suddenly, Beso seized Hayakujo by the nose and twisted it. Overcome by pain, Hayakujo cried out, Oh, oh! You say they have flown away, said Beso. But they have all been here from the beginning. Then Hayakujo's back ran with sweat, and he had Satori. The difference between these two statements is so enormous that they cannot be reconciled with one another. They have flown away is a self-evident statement of ordinary common sense. They are no longer visible. They have disappeared somewhere. Hence, they are no longer here and are not present for me. No illumination is needed to establish that fact. But Beso sees quite differently. Seeing with your natural eyes, which everyone possesses from birth, can only mean registering what comes before your eyes at any moment out of all that exists. In order for something to come before your eyes, it must exist. With the third eye, which is acquired only when one is reborn, you see just this existence of something that is, the ground of its being. Therefore the statement must be, they have always been here. Naturally, not at this point of space, as space and time have no part in this vision. What is bound to appear senseless, perverse, a poor joke, is thus in reality a quite simple statement of fact a fact which Beso sees as clearly and as corporeally as Hayakujo sees the fact that the geese have flown away. Neither of these facts refutes the other, as they belong to totally different dimensions, and Hayakujo would never have been able to find the solution by prolonged reflection. Only at the acute moment of pain, which stopped him from thinking, did he find the solution through Satori. Now, though you may have the feeling that you could get something out of this statement of Bezos, understand it in some way and then justify it. You must not imagine that you can adopt Bezos' standpoint and project something meaningful, possibly even profound, into his statement. That is not the point at all. Everything depends on your seeing, as Bezo did, at the first glance with an immediacy of vision, which is so and not otherwise. Beso, for his part, naturally understood Hayakujo's statement. He once shared this point of view and regarded it as normal. But he also understood that it is unspiritual and eccentric. It would be a misunderstanding to think that the illuminating vision, though it may bring a fundamental gain, nevertheless involves a great loss that it overlooks the bodily fullness of existence, here and now, which is thus robbed of its meaning. For, important as it is to see things in the light of their illustrious origin, it is equally important to accept them simply as they are, to perceive not only that something manifests itself in them, but the form in which it is manifested. This objection does not hit the mark precisely because the illuminating vision does not inquire what meaning the seen might have in relation to the seer, it permits each existence to be true of itself, according to its origin. It grasps things as they are meant to be. For, to the degree that their formless origin is inaccessible and inconceivable, things in their concrete forms become more accessible to us. Bathed in the light of their origin, they themselves are illuminated. The more mysterious their ground, the more revealingly do they stand before us. The more silent they are about the ultimate questions, the less silent they are about themselves. 
This enables the visionary to let them go their own way without saddling them with his own preoccupations. Far from taking them as mere manifestations of a primal ground, which at this state is inaccessible and incomprehensible, he lets each thing be itself. The peculiar quality of this selfless vision enables him to do this to an astonishing degree. As if he were right outside the bounds of animate nature, he enjoys the most intimate contact with things and their fate, even with those that seem wholly absorbed in their material existence. Occasionally he can intensify this contact to the point of complete union. It then seems to him that things do not come to him in this vision, but that they come to themselves, and that only then do they attain full reality, as if being were beholding itself in everything that is, as if it embraced and sustained the process of seeing. He then no longer feels himself as the subjective pole confronted by things as objects. He feels being as the one pole of an essentially inconceivable nature, and himself, together with everything that happens, as to the other pole of concrete existence, which, like himself, proceeds from the origin. For what applies to each and everything applies to also the so-called ego. In this vision, the ego too becomes transparent, even to the ultimate depths of what is grounded. Here we may recall the cone. Show me your original face before you were born. That is, before you existed as an individual ego, as this particular person, in the world of multiplicity and oppositeness. Again, the solution of the cone consists in seeing the original face with your spiritual third eye, finding it rather than inventing it with the aid of reflection. What you then experience in regard to your own ego is not transferred by analogy to another ego, still less to things. All these other forms are directly experienced, too, each by itself from the origin. It may be this kind of seeing is a repetition, a revival, an intensified form of an attitude which comes naturally to us in childhood. Then the thing we are playing with was experienced truly as itself, without our being related to it in any way, so that it seemed as if all the action proceeded from it and it were playing with us. However that may be, and whether Satori is a reversion to the past or a completely new and unique happening, it is without doubt a tremendously powerful experience of the absolute and undifferentiated, summoning up all one's subjective forces and putting them at its service. It is vision, experience, penetration, and being penetrated in one. It is therefore understandable that the Zen masters permit, at the very most, exclamations like stick, snow, wild geese. But consider these statements. This is a stick. Those are wild geese. Just as fallacious as the reverse, this is not a stick. Those are not wild geese. And the wild geese have flown away. Just as fallacious as they have not flown away. A person who judges in this manner, who isolates things both from himself and from one to another, breaking up the whole, is no longer a seer, but an observer, who stands outside the picture and experiences the opposite as observed. He does not feel one with what he sees. He is addressed by things as if from the outside, and in turn questions them so that they shall answer. In this game of question and answer, he fancies what he has grasped the full reality of the object, and exhausted it, not noticing that he must be content with the mere substitute. Between himself and the object, there is interposed a mirror image, which he crams with meaning, not realizing that for the seer his vision is overflowing with meaning. 
and that he has only to keep himself open to receive it. For an observer, consciously relating everything to everything else, past and future are clearly divided in everything he perceives. Vision is not like this. It consists in a non-related present, in an unreflected now of timeless occurrence. The rhythm is not felt as anything extraneous, but as one's own pulsing together with all things in an exhaustible and boundless process of change. If, therefore, the Zen masters discountenance any statement about the illuminating vision, it is not because they recommend a return to the mental primitiveness of the immature. What they require is not only the attainment of the original mind, but its conservation. This original state is not primitive, however simple and simple-minded it may look. It is the product of unceasing spiritual discipline and it leads to a freedom to which, in truth, nothing is impossible. But it is not in the spirit of Zen to demand this anthropological attitude on principle and apply it forcibly to all spheres of life. Principles of any kind are foreign to Zen. Not only is it admitted that there are spheres of life in which assertions, judgments, plans, and purposeful actions play a part, but Zen even goes as far as to acknowledge that these modes of behavior are necessary to existence, thus justifying the destruction of the primal unity, the split into object and subject, but only up to the point where it threatens danger and disaster. <laughs>